Good morning, welcome to Talk Wildlife and welcome to another of the Kruger Park specials with Robert from Outlook Safaris. Morning Robert, how are you? Hey Alan, good to be back. I'm well, thank you. I hope the same on your side. Excellent, yeah, I'm fine, thanks. Um, I think you're more in danger than I am because I'm stood away from the water hole, but you've got our leopard very near to you. <laughs> I do. Um, yeah, so ironically, I've just introduced two of the big five. What we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the big five. Um, the big five are the rhinos, of which there's two uh, different species, uh, the buffalo, the leopard, the lion, and the. Um, what are they? The what? Elephant. Just kind of complete brain freeze then. So the elephant, then things. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk about the big five and uh, we're going to talk about sort of the big five within Kruger National Park. So we'll talk around sort of what they are, where they are um, and basically just introduce you to them. So I think what I'll do first, Robert, is I'll share screen because we have got some pictures. Uh, thanks, Robert, for supplying a few. Uh, I've used a few of my own. So if you go to Kruger Park, you can get pictures like this. I don't pretend to be a good for, uh, photographer, but you can get some decent photographs. Robert, on the other hand, is a very good photographer, but he's too modest to say so. Right, so I'll share screen. Okay, so Robert, you should be seeing the slides, are you? Yes, I am. Excellent, because if you are, then the world is. Good, so we'll start off with uh, the rhinos. So, as I mentioned before, there's two different species of rhino in Kruger. Uh, there's the white rhino and there's the black rhino. So I think, best bet, Robert, if you start off by telling us what the difference is, because it's not as clear cut as one's black and one's white. So. Can you just give us a quick introduction as to the difference? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, so just to put a bit of context in, behind this, um, originally the rhinos with the early Dutch settlers, uh, there's people looked at the, the, the rhinos, the black and the white rhinos. The white rhinos were the first to be seen and they've got a very broad, wide lip because they are grass feeders. Um, not that clear in these pictures on the left is a white rhino and then bottom right is also a white rhino calf uh, and they graze on grass. So the Dutch people referred to the wide lip and they said weight and this was interpreted as white um, and the name just stuck as being white and obviously if the one is white then the other one must be black. Um, so it's got nothing to do with the actual color of the animals. The white rhino is the bigger of the two. And because it's a grazer, you tend to find them more in open areas where there's a lot of grassland. And then your black rhino, if you look at that picture in the top right, it has a, a, a hooked prehensile upper lip, which it uses to browse. So your black rhinos prefer more dense vegetation where they browse on leaves and shoots and twigs of bushes um, and then the other common difference if you see the two um, species with young is the white rhino typically has its young uh, in front of it when it's moving through the the grasslands and your black rhino will have the calves moving behind them and that is typically how um, these animals move around in the bush uh, how much more did you want me to share on these uh, yeah, so I mean, it's great now that we've got the difference. So with regards to populations in Kruger Park, are, they, are these sort of quite uh, you know, are, are densely populated? Which one's the more common of the two? Yeah, so your white rhino is quite a bit more common, not just in the Kruger Park, but throughout Africa. Um, in, in the Kruger Park, uh, numerous uh, rhino species and I'll also just add this that because of uh, it being a very sensitive subject at the moment with the uh, poaching of rhinos uh, it would be best for me not to divulge specific information as to good areas to see which species but the white rhinos can be seen throughout the park 
black rhinos are typically typically confined to areas where the bushes is, is more dense, which is what their preferred habitat is like. But certainly, uh, white rhinos are a lot more numerous than the black rhinos. Uh, most people on a visit of three, four days to the park would be able to f see a white rhino, whereas black rhinos are considered uh, a real special sighting on a, on a safari. Yeah, yeah, I know from our visit, we've seen one black rhino and we've seen quite a lot of white rhino. Um, so that's great. And and what you'll notice there is the oxpeckers on both pictures. So they, they, the oxpeckers sort of don't discriminate, you know, they, they go on the black rhino and on the white rhino and anything else that moves pretty much. Um, but yeah, so that, that's great. So with regards to aggression, if you're sitting in your car, are these, if, if you're sort of driving through the park and you come across these and even without young and, you know, are they are they quite aggressive towards the cars or are you okay? Uh, both white and black rhinos have very poor eyesight and that adds to their aggression because they can easily be startled by sudden movement. So while their eyesight is bad, their hearing and their sense of smell is really good. And fortunately, in places like the Kruger, where you have a lot of people and vehicles moving, they've become accustomed to the sounds of vehicles and people even talking, being in the vehicle. So normally they, they aren't too disturbed by vehicles. But your white rhinos are a lot more docile in nature when compared to the black rhinos. So most of the time, white rhinos, you can approach or you can stop. I mean, it's, it's never really advisable to to approach any of these big five or the dangerous animals, but to rather allow them to come into your space. Um, so the white rhinos, you can get quite close to it, whereas the black rhino, um, a lot of times it just depends on the actual individual, but with them, they could end up charging a vehicle. You need to be alert, and I would say it's best if you see a black rhino not to switch off your engine, and just determine is this an animal which is comfortable with your presence or uh, is it showing any aggression towards you? Um, sometimes it has been known for black rhinos to just charge vehicles and you know, you're looking at one and a half ton, 1,500 kilograms coming at you at pace that can do considerable damage to a vehicle. So it's best to, to keep your distance um, and again, that's where being with a guide comes in handy because a guide should be able to see, is this animal showing warning signs? Should I be moving away or am I okay to stay where I am? And what should somebody look out for as warning signs? So if they do come across Rhino and they're in their own car, at what point should they be thinking, do you know what, I think I better leave? Yeah, so with the uh, white Rhino, because they typically occur in more open areas and a person can normally watch them from a distance. And then if they approach, you can watch their, their body movement. Um, if they just walking, feeding, you shouldn't have any problem. Um, but the moment they have their heads lifted and you can see that their attention has shifted from the food or the eating to your movement, then I would say then you need to be aware that it is wondering, is this a safe situation or not? And if some people then continue to push on closer to the rhino, then it may end up charging the vehicle. Um, sometimes the movement from the rhino will become very exaggerated, turning around 360 degrees, um, and just it's trying to establish, you know, is this a threat? or is it something that it doesn't need to worry about? Black rhinos don't necessarily always give you all that warning because they prefer dense vegetation. You may be driving along and just that sudden flash of color from the vehicle and the movement may just trigger it into thinking this is something dangerous. It's, it's um, a danger to me and, and it may just come running right out of the bush um, towards the vehicle. Uh, so not much. Sometimes there may be a bit of snorting or blowing sounds, um, but I think this is, if it gets to that point, then you should have left long ago. 
<laughs> yeah, too right. And just to put it into context, because clearly what I don't want to do is sort of scaremonger here. Um, you know, this is purely down to just being sensible. At the end of the day, you know, if you came across a wasp's nest, you wouldn't go up and flick it and you wouldn't stand too close to it. You'd give it some respect. This is purely about showing some respect for these animals because, you know, these are not caged animals in a zoo. These are out in the wild and you're in their domain. It's, you know, you are entering their habitat. So you've got to just basically be responsible. You know, so I don't think you need to be scared. I think you need to be respectful. Is that right? Yes, that's 100% correct. I mean, we need to understand that when we visit places like the Kruger Park, you are going into the animal's domain. You are there to appreciate nature as it ought to be. So you do not want to be putting the animals in a place where they feel threatened by your presence. So it's always best to rather keep your distance than to try and approach an animal it can be tempting for people wanting to get better photos to get closer to these animals, but obviously the sense needs to prevail and you need to be cautious um, at all times when approaching these animals. Great. So then we move on to an even bigger animal, um, African elephants. Now, you know, there, there's nothing better than sitting in a car or in a Jeep watching a herd of elephants um uh, they're, they're just amazing uh, we, we've been in I've, I've had numbers of encounters with elephants and at one stage we were actually surrounded by a really large herd they actually we were the only um vehicle on the road uh the guide that was with us at the time was villain um fantastic experience guy he read where they were going to go in the bush and he went down this path and he waited for them to come to him as you said earlier and they surrounded us and they had sort of a baby with them um and it was just an incredible experience and they were really 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 close to where we were sat but there was absolutely no sign of any stress from any of the animals and that i put down to willem's experience you know it's he put us in that situation knowingly but because he makes it experienced, he knew that he wasn't putting us in danger. And that was that was class. So, again, elephants, fantastic things. How many elephants do you reckon there are throughout the park? And how, how endangered are both they and rhino from the likes of poaching? Yeah, so elephants, um, to answer your first question, elephants... At the, at the last count, there was an excess of 15,000 elephants in the Kruger Park. Um, in the 1900s and for a long period, uh, the, the Kruger Park, for the size of the park, it was established that for, for the amount of food that animal, uh, the animals need or the elephants need, the park could sustain a healthy population of between seven and 9,000 elephants. And that is the number that was sort of kept. Once the numbers increased beyond that, there was culling that took place. Uh, but because of a, an outcry from the public, because of the culling methods, um, it was later left. Uh, well, it, it, it's not quite that simple. There was various processes that took place, um, but that's, that's quite a long conversation on its own. But they did then leave the populations to grow. And so there is an excess of 15,000 elephants, which is double of what was originally determined um, is, is a, a sustainable population for the park. And yet, in spite of all those animals in the park, it's not as though a person can clearly see that it's made a bigger impact in the park. And the park is fenced, so these anim animals are contained within an area, but fortunately, because of the size of the park, there is a lot of movement, a lot of uh, area for the animals to move. Um, where, when a person goes to the park, um, you can find these, uh, you can find the elephants pretty much wherever you go. Uh, typically people find lone bulls walking around or sometimes as you can see in that small image is uh, a breeding herd and the elephants uh, are led by a lead female that's known as the matriarch. And she walks with her younger fee the, the younger females, her sisters, and then their offspring, and then the males stay with the 
with the herd until they reach sexual maturity, which is typically between sort of 13 and 15 years of age, before they slowly start getting pushed out by the females. Now, those males are quite um, vulnerable to being attacked still. And what you'll sometimes find is that those males will try and find or locate a big elephant bull. You can see the image on the right there is a nice big elephant tusker. And those big male bulls will act almost like a fatherly figure, giving the younger bull the protection that he needs while he's still young, but also he gives them discipline, um, which elephants need or they just um, get completely out of hand. And then, so your elephant bulls, you'll typically, when you drive in the Kruger Park, the lone animals, or sometimes you'll see the bulls, um, two, three, four, maybe a few bigger bulls come together, but they never really stay together for long periods. Whereas your elephant herds are always, they uh, are in groups in those herds in contact with each other all the time. Um, elephants were poached a lot for their tusks, the poaching, uh, attention has certainly shifted onto rhinos in recent years, although the ivory from elephant tusks is still very, very valuable. Uh, they are, the focus is not as much on the killing of, of elephants as it is on rhino. Right. OK. And, and again, I mentioned sort of us being surrounded by a herd of, of elephants. Um, What's you know how what is the best way if you, if you're sort of self-driving what's the best way of approaching or not approaching elephant if you see them um, you know how should you respond? So with elephants, I always say it's best if the animals approach you. Never drive up to an elephant. These animals are a lot bigger than your vehicle, and it takes very little effort for either a cow or a bull to push over a vehicle and cause considerable uh, damage. So it's best to give these animals the space, um, enjoy them from a distance. And if you find yourself in a position where suddenly you have elephants coming up from behind you and you didn't notice that they were coming up from behind you, if you have sufficient time and you have a road open, it may be best without a guide or the knowledge of a guide to guide you to then just move ahead to give them their space. Uh, occasionally you may find yourself caught up um, in amongst elephants. It's, it, it may be a lot to ask, but you need to remain calm and not make any sudden movements or sounds. And typically elephants um, that have approached you are just on their way, they're feeding, and as long as you don't give them any reason um, to be startled, then they should just keep on moving. But you never really want to find yourself in a situation where you're surrounded by an elephant herd. It's, you know, while you can look at an elephant and you can, as, a, as an educated guest or guide, look at its behavior and determine this animal is quite relaxed or not, you never want, you, you can never know for sure whether that elephant is going to be okay with you there or it's going to maybe turn and, and attack the vehicle. So giving space is always number one priority. Yeah, and that that's, um, so just to put into context what I said at the beginning about us being surrounded by elephants, because we genuinely were, I have to say, it, you know, we were with a guy that was, you know, he knew what he was doing. He had many, many, many years of experience. Um, we actually had to wait for the elephants to come to us. He didn't drive into the center of them. What he did was he, he plotted in his head where they were going to go, and then he went down. I'm not sure he was anticipating they would actually quite come out around the vehicle, uh, but he went and parked his vehicle so that he wasn't obstructing them. They, they had a sort of free reign to go where they wanted, but they chose to go around the vehicle. So, you know, it's not something I certainly would do if I was sitting in a car, um, but he knew exactly what he was doing. And and I have to say, you know, staying calm, when you say staying calm, I, I was sat right in the back of the Jeep. And it, it, if you haven't been one of the Jeeps, they actually tear the seats. So I was actually quite high, almost elephant eye level. And they came, I don't know, maybe within 15 feet of the back of the vehicle. 
And I can hand on heart saying that I never felt threatened or scared or nervous at all. Now, maybe that's just because I'm weird. Uh, the guy, the German guy that was sat next to me was terrified. He, tell, he told me afterwards, but I didn't even, I didn't even think about the fact that we might be in danger. I just was absolutely in awe of these things and completely honoured to be surrounded by them. And as I say, they didn't give me any inkling that they might suddenly turn. They were just really, really calm, but it, not something I would do if, if I was in my own car. So, yeah, that, that's the African elephant. Amazing, amazing animal. Another one, um, again, you know, the big, the powerful, um, there seems to be quite a lot of them. Sometimes you see some quite big herds is, is the buffalo. So I know that some people have heard of these as Cape buffalo and the sort of buffalo. So I'm assuming it is the same animal. Is that right? Yes. So referred to as the Cape buffalo or the African buffalo, same species. Um, not to be confused with the Asian buffalo, which is an animal that's been domesticated. Um, these African buffalo, you cannot domesticate. Um, they've got a very wild side to them um, that never really tames. And um, it is for very good reason that it forms one of the big five. Um, something which we didn't mention that I can maybe just quickly touch on is the term big five comes not because these are the big, biggest five animals in the bush, but because in the early day hunting times, these were seen or regarded as the five most dangerous animals to hunt. Um, a lot of people ask, why isn't the giraffe one of the big five? Or why isn't a cheetah one of the big five? These animals are docile animals and don't, don't nearly show the aggression uh, that the big five could in a typical hunting situation. So although they are dangerous for people, visitors to the park, they are only dangerous if uh, there's any aggression or lack of respect shown to these animals. So the big five and, and the danger behind them really stems from the hunting times and how you would need to approach this animal on foot and the consequences um, if you were to hunt it and shoot and not make a kill instantly. So just uh, thought I'd just mention that as as uh, additional information. Cape buffalo, um, it's one of those animals, uh, uh, a guide from one of the lodges that we often used to take clients to, uh, used to say something which I thought was quite amusing. It's the only animal uh, that he used to say that looks at you as though you owe it money. Um, they always seem to have this aggressive, uh, not a very happy or friendly look. Um, but really, buffalo uh, as a herd uh, can be similar to a herd of cattle. Um, if you are in the Kruger Park doing a game drive and you come across a big herd of buffalo, it can be an amazing experience. Again, you can sit quietly and you can enjoy these animals grazing. And um, I've certainly been in situations where I've been completely surrounded by them. And um, they typically just move along feeding, grazing. Uh, they are very curious animals, so they may sometimes stop and stare at the vehicle. And maybe if there's any sounds or chattering coming from the vehicle, there may be more heads lifted um, in your direction. But again, if you don't show them in, if there's no reason um, for them to feel threatened by you being there, then you shouldn't have to worry about them. On the other hand, um, you do get lone buffalo bulls like those two that you see lying in the mud there, those are what we refer to as dugga bulls. Dugga just referring to mud. Uh, they often like to lie in mud and get themselves caked in mud like that, which helps against parasites and biting insects. And um, these bulls have typically been pushed out of breeding herds. They face a lot of pressure from attacks from lions. Um, they don't have that security of the herd anymore. And so their temperament changes completely and they can become quite aggressive. Um, you can view these animals from a distance. Sometimes you can get a small group of these bulls, five, six, seven animals. Keep your distance once again. Watch them, enjoy them. 
um, but it is not advisable to try and push up close to them. Um, very occasionally you may find only one single bull on his own and, and my suggestion then for people that are doing a self-drive is to, to definitely keep your distance. Those bulls um, won't hesitate to, to charge the vehicle if they see it as, as any threat to their well-being. Right. Right. Good. And, and what's the density of these? You know, they, are they sort of a lot of them seem to be a lot of them when we sort of went over there. Is there a lot of them in the park? Yes, a lot of buffalo throughout the park. Um, I'm not too certain on the, the latest numbers, um, but you can see them throughout the park. Uh, big herds, uh, typically a person may come across herds of around uh, anywhere from 50 individuals to about 150, 200. But there is a herd in the park that um, they reckon is in excess of 800 animals. Um, so quite spectacular when you come across those very big herds. And of course, they are also, uh, their movement attracts the predators, especially lions that would prey on buffalo. Um, so sometimes people that stick around with the bigger herds of buffalo may be rewarded with lion sightings as well. Yeah, right. Okay, and, and just so... Just on this one and the elephant, because I know we can't mention it and we won't mention it on the rhino, but on elephants and these, is there a, uh, is there a specific, um, not so much camp in the park, but is there a specific area of the park where you're best choosing your camp if you do want to see these? Um, both of these species are fairly prolific throughout the park. Um, with elephants, elephants move according to where there's sufficient food for them. Um, buffalo don't cover as much distance as the elephants may, may but um, I would say if you go to, um, well, again, uh, the southern parts, Lower Sabi can be really good for buffalo around the Pretorius Corp area. Uh, if you look at areas where there's sufficient water, because both these species enjoy a lot of water, so spend some time along the river courses at dams, you may find these, these both these animals, uh, species. Um, elephants, uh, just because of their, their sheer size, it's not easy to miss them. Um, the whole southern area, there's a big variety of vegetation types for elephants, so, so definitely the whole southern area but that doesn't mean that there is necessarily fewer elephants further north. I would just say that as you move into your central and north of the central park, those camps, Lataba, Mopani, you often tend to find more lone bulls than the breeding herds. The breeding herds are more often encountered further south. And then your buffalo, there isn't really a specific camp. They like the Mopani woodlands uh, in the central part of the park, but you can certainly find them throughout the southern areas. And as I say, just find a suitable river, course, um, dams, pools, mud pools, as those you often bump into some bulls that are resting up in the midday heat. Right. Okay. So we've talked about the first three uh white rhino elephant buffalo uh, you know you will see them um it's hard not to see them black rhino different story we're now going to the, the sort of last two of the big five that are a bit more difficult to come across uh, and make you work a bit harder um first one is the leopard uh, we were really lucky i mean obviously your photograph on the uh, right, mine on the left. That, that's um, we, we've had glimpses of leopard, but that particular one was just sat by the side of the road. Um, we almost missed it actually, but um, we, we fortunately, so sort of we, we parked up, no other cars around, so we just shared 10 15 minutes with this leopard. Absolutely awesome creature. So, first of all, talk to us about leopards. Are there many leopards in the park? I know, I mean, there's you know, they are quite hard to find. Is that because they, there's few of them or the secretive? Um, yeah, so the last figures were around a thousand, but possibly in excess of a thousand. Uh, these are animals that in the traditional way of counting animals by flying with helicopters or small planes, 
uh, it's not an animal that you're going to easily see and be able to count like you can herds of, of uh, antelope. Um, but with later newer technology um, and a lot of rangers moving through bush, they are able to track and uh, plot the movement of various leopard species. And so they can get a better uh, idea of the number. So definitely I would say more than a thousand leopards in the Kruger Park. Um, they are masters of camouflage. Uh, so you really need to move through the park slowly with uh, uh, the intent of, of uh, looking for any pattern that maybe stands out. Um, there, both those images shown there of leopards lying in trees. But in my experience, most of the time that I've seen leopards in the Kruger Park, they've actually been on the ground. And depending on the season um, or the area, if it's tall grass, uh, you could be just meters away from this animal and not even see it. Um, they have become quite accustomed to vehicle movement as well. So but, uh, you could sometimes find leopards just walking along the road. Some are very relaxed with vehicle presence. Others um, tend to be a lot shyer and move away as soon as they hear an oncoming vehicle. But they also have their own personality. So you may find the same animal two days in a row on two different drives. The one day it's very relaxed, the next day it's, it's very skittish. Uh, it just depends on, on their circumstances and maybe um, any threats that they have faced during the night. Um, a, a very dangerous animal. Um, they are a lot small, smaller than lions, but for body size, they are incredibly powerful animals. Of course, they typically pull up uh, their prey into a tree which is where they can feed on it without having their kills stolen away by hyenas or by lions. <clears throat> and it's um, probably that one species in the big five that most people uh, have as number one on their list of, of animals to see. Um, if you spend the right amount of time in good habitat, um, you can see the species wherever you go through the park. Again, the uh, river courses where there's nice big trees, riverine areas, uh, that's where you can typically find leopards. There's an abundance of food for them there, um, but you can also find them in the open savanna areas, grasslands, and uh, what's quite nice about those particular animals is they, uh, in body size, they are bigger than the ones that you'd find in more dense vegetation, um, so very impressive animals. And uh, yeah, just as far as what they would typically prey on, I mean, leopards don't need anything big to survive on. They can take small things, rodents, uh, lizards even, to feed on, but they will go for things the size of buffalo calves if given the opportunity, um, zebra foals, wildebeest, all sorts of uh, bigger animals. Um, body size, these the females uh, can be quite small, um, anywhere from sort of 30 to 50 kilograms, so not really that big at all. Males up to 90 and in excess of 90 kilograms, um, but very, very powerful animals. Yeah, yeah. And I know you mentioned to me after we did the camp um, video that there'd been a leopard now I think you said in Bergendal in inside the camp so that just spurred me to uh, think about right okay so I mean I, I walked around the camp a lot and I'm still here uh, and I did it at any camp I've been to um, there was a main camp because I've been to Kakuza, Petrorius Cop and Bergendal um, and you do feel secure because there are sort of electric fences around the outside but just just slightly off to, uh, off topic for a second. How safe are you in the actual camps itself? Because we, we didn't really go into great depths on that in the camp one. If there was a leopard inside the camp in Bergendal, um, just how safe are you? I mean, you know, th is this a regular occurrence? Again, I don't want to scare people. I don't want to put them off. And as I say, I, I walked around and I, I'm still alive. Um, but just so the people again can show that respect. How common is that? Yeah, so it's not common at all. 
um, well, at least for, you know, people actually seeing these animals in the camps. Uh, there has been a few camps where leopards have been found inside the camps. Typically, um, these will be camps where there's a lot of natural vegetation within the camp. So the animal may be coming in just purely looking for food, not with the intent of looking for a person to attack. Um, but when you do find these animals, it's always best to be cautious. And uh, when rangers or, or people know that there is a, a leopard within the camp, then they will normally try and uh, get these uh, animals out of the camps as soon as possible. Often they leave of their own accord, um, but not, not necessarily knowing what the reason is for the animal coming into the camp. You may um, find, for instance, that uh, an animal uh, is a, it's an older animal, it's been struggling uh, to make a kill of its own and it may be looking for easier opportunities. Um, so that is a possibility, but highly unlikely. Um, again, you need to be aware of your surrounds. You are inside uh, an area where there's a lot of uh, dangerous animals. So if you are going to move through the camp and especially in camps where there is uh, a lot of natural bush, it's probably best not to walk around in those particular areas at night time. Um, stay in open areas. I mean, to walk from your room to the restaurant um, or in areas where there's a lot of human movement or where there's a lot of light shouldn't be a problem. But you don't want to go walking on any trails that some of the camps have where it is very dark and uh, there's a lot of vegetation and bush and you don't know what may be lurking. Yeah, yeah. And so <laughs> if I did have, say I'd have been walking around uh, the entire camp and I'd come across a leopard in the camp, what should I do? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, I know it's, 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 it's going to be an extremely rare thing to happen. But just in case, when I'm next there, I'm wandering around the camp and there's a leopard. What do I do? Well, uh, the best thing I think with with any dangerous, potentially dangerous situation would be to um, avoid obviously going any closer. Um, I think animals that come into the camps or that may venture into the camps um, will quite often come in there not with the intent, as I said, uh, to actually attack someone. They may just be roaming through the camp. You want to avoid any closer contact with that animal. Um, the animals are used to people because they would have seen people alongside the camp fences um, previously. So it knows what people are. It hasn't experienced any threat in the past because people have walked along a fence and it's actually watched people, whether people know it's there or not. So it may just be moving through the camp and it's not actually bothered by you being there, but it comes as a fright to you more than it does to the leopard because it quite likely knows you are there or you are approaching. So the best thing I would say is, and it depends on a lot of um, scenarios, but it would be to stand still and then if, the animal doesn't show any aggression to you, um, or even if it does start snarling, you want to give it as much space as you possibly can and start moving back slowly away from the animal, um, rather than to uh, try and approach closer because people would actually do this. I think people would be so amazed by this animal in the, in the camp. And it's strange how people's minds work, but the first, Thing that jumped to people's minds is oh, I need to get a photo of this. Yeah. Um, so people may actually try and go closer for photos. But just to avoid any closer um, contact with the animal, slowly try and move away if the situation allows. Um, I would say if there's extreme aggression to just stand your ground for a moment and let the animal move away of its own accord um, and then you move in an opposite direction. Right. Okay, I'll remember that the next time I'm out there. Um, ju just again, I, I'm, I know I'm sidetracking and I tend to do this, but just just a, a slight thing. Um, 
when we were at uh, Skakuza and we were talking to somebody, um, one of your guys, and they were telling us that actually, because we, we'd seen hyena along the fence, which is amazing, and I mean really, really, really close, uh, but along the other side of the fence. And he was telling us that a, a guy actually was letting his his child put food through the fence to try and feed this thing. Do people, I, I don't know what I'm trying to say here, but people seem to lose all sensibility that you know, this, this is a hyena. A hyena could tear that kid's arm off um, really, really easy. Do you, do you think that people are showing enough respect for the wildlife that are sort of in and around the camp? Uh, I think that is um, a question that I can only answer by saying, you know, some people uh, show a very healthy respect when they are in animals' natural environment and in dangerous situations, where others um, have sort of uh, perhaps more of a macho attitude and feel that they are in control of the situation and that um, feeling of being in control permits them or allows them um, to do as they please um, and that of, obviously as a person can imagine can lead to very very dangerous situations. So um, I don't think people often realize the danger that there is out there. There's a reason why camp fences are, uh, camps are fenced off. There's a reason why a lot of these um, uh, warning notifications that are out there say do not approach these animals, um, do not feed the animals. Most of the camps, especially those where there's a lot of hyena activity at night, will actually have boards on the fences saying, please do not feed the animals. And those signs are not there because they just want to avoid people suddenly feeding them. They are there, unfortunately, because a lot of people have thought it's a very cute thing to do to feed the, the, the hyena. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the people that feed the animals are people that don't have uh, the necessary knowledge or understanding of, of the bush and quite often visitors who leave after a few days and they've actually just made situations worse yeah. by eating these animals. Yeah, so I mean the message there is, you know, and, and we've talked a lot about sort of respecting the animals, but also don't feed the animals. I mean, <laughs> It's just crazy, you know, you wouldn't you wouldn't go to a zoo and climb over the first barrier and stick your hand through the fence of a cheetah or a leopard or anything like that and say, here, do you want to have a, a piece of my sandwich? So just bear it in mind and, and don't, don't feed the animals, uh, especially not with yourself. That, that would be wrong. So we come to the final of the big five. Um, and what probably for a lot of people is a huge draw to Kruger. Um, the German guy I mentioned earlier, he was there four days and, and basically lion fanatic, only wanted to see lion, not saying he wasn't interested in some other, the other stuff, but was desperate for lion and he did get lion, which was really good. So let's talk lions. So first of all, you know, how many in the park? I mean, well, how many, how many prides, how big are prides? Let's, let's find out a little bit about sort of their behavior first of all. So how many in the park? So lions, um, they estimate the last numbers I looked at were around 1,500. There was some concern from general public that their numbers had decreased considerably. Uh, their numbers were certainly uh, more in the, the range of 3,000, uh, I would say in the 80s, 90s, 1980, 1990s. And then their numbers dropped quite a bit to 1,500. As I say, there was a lot of concern from public that the lion population numbers are dropping. Um, various people that do research on lion populations say it's not something to be too alarmed of. Uh, there's a typical cycle that happens over the years where some years, depending on the abundance of uh, prey, uh, in various climatic situations, you may actually find numbers increasing favorably. And then other times due to various 
reasons, you'll find the population numbers actually drop quite a lot. So what people were actually saying is, although there's a fewer lines around now, you may find in 10, 20 years from now, the population has boomed again and it has doubled. Um, so that definitely needs to, to be considered before, um, you know, making any rash, rash um, uh, impressions or, or giving yourself reasons as to what is actually happening in the background. Um, lions, uh, typically the herd structure or the pride structure, <laughs> not herds, prides, uh, you'll, you'll find is dominant as a dominant male, um, sometimes two, three, four dominant males, and then the, the females and the offspring, uh, there's one pride in the Kruger Park, which I think is around 25, 28 individuals, which is a really big pride, but typically they are a lot smaller prides than that, 6, uh, 10, 12, 15 maybe in a pride. Um, what I found interesting in the past uh, years is how lions form a coalition to improve their success in the pride. So in the past, it, you seem to find one dominant male, maybe two males that run a pride. Now it's not uncommon to find five or even in excess of five males um, running a pride. And these males will obviously, with them forming that coalition, be a better able to defend their pride and their young. Sorry, Robert, just had to nip and answer the door, but I did still hear most of what you just said. Okay. Apologies, everybody. Shall we, Sorry? Yeah. Shall we redo that? I No, 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 don't worry. We'll, we'll leave that because, you know, I'm, I'm sure everybody will forgive me for nipping off to answer the door. <laughs> so, yeah. So with with regards to lions, again, you know, everybody wants to see them. So whereabouts sort of roughly in the park? Are you bet you know what's what's the best camps for actually staying in if you want to see lions? Uh, again, that's uh, something I can I can say. There's a few camps that would probably be the ones that you would go to if you wanted to see these animals. Um, but I don't want to detract from the possibility of actually seeing these or bumping into these animals anywhere in the park. Uh, lions roam throughout the park, so there certainly is a possibility of seeing them anywhere. Um, as I've mentioned in a previous chat with you, Satara has a reputation for its big cat sightings. Um, you'll see both the top pictures there were from the Satara area where it's a more open savanna. But you would just want to, um, because one of their main prey items would be buffalo, if you can come across herds of buffalo um, and maybe follow behind these herd of buffalo or stay within um, reach of these buffalo, there's a fairly good possibility that you could stumble upon lions. Again, uh, where, their prey, where there's sufficient prey source. So if you find big herds of zebra or wildebeest moving into an area, lions will typically be in the vicinity as well. They are animals which prefer spending most of their day resting up. Um, so it's not always that easy to see them, especially you can see the coloration there compared with the grass and the surrounding vegetation. If they flop down into that bush, it's very difficult to see them. But early mornings, late afternoons, you'd hopefully find them moving along and that is the, would be the best time to bump into them. Yeah, and we uh, on the second visit that we were there, we uh, we were driving along the road before breakfast. In fact, I, I don't even think we'd been out much more than fifteen minutes, and two males walked along the side of the road, um, which we got really good views of. And then we came across another two in a driver of a bed, and then we came across these, which is the sort of bottom middle. Uh, which was the female, and there was actually three 
young were there. There was, there was another one that had it. I didn't realise until it popped its head up from behind. Um, and then on the right, this male lion arrived and was approached by the, the cub on the, the left. Um, it was such a brilliant interaction. And that was all within probably an hour and a half of leaving the camp. So you can be really, really, really lucky. This, the third time, last time we went, was not as lucky. We we got we, we could hear lion on the kill, um, which was distant. We saw one lion, which unfortunately some idiot with a drone scared off. Um, and then I, I think we saw another one more at a distance. So again, it's hit and miss. It's like anything in wildlife. You know, it, it, you're either really, really lucky on occasions or sometimes you have to really, really work hard for it. Uh, but lions obviously worth sort of worth working hard for it so anything else that you want to add on lions no i would just say that because it's um got this uh reputation as being king of the jungle and you've got uh children uh movies like the lion king there is a, a lot of emphasis placed on lions and people wanting to see the species and um it's not always guaranteed. Um, it's a vast wilderness where you've got to have a certain amount of luck in finding these animals. Uh, and I would just say, you know, if you really want to see lions, the best thing is to keep your ears open, take it slowly as you drive through the park, and stop regularly, switch off your engine, listen for any alarm calls possibly given by Impala, or any animal um, which would indicate the presence of a predator, um, and then you may be in luck. You may actually find these animals if you, uh, they say, early bird catches the worm. So it's best to get out early in the morning in the cooler hours, which is when the cats also prefer moving around. As soon as it gets too warm, these animals just uh, lie up for the rest of the day, and unless it is close to the road, in an open patch somewhere you're not likely to to see them easily yeah and, and again show a lot of respect and you, you see sort of videos on youtube and stuff like that um of people sort of surrounding the lions in their cars um you know and some of them even opening the windows and the lions getting agitated if you don't show respect and you do get killed, then it's the lion that's going to suffer. You're daft enough to put yourself in that situation and you got killed. That's your fault. Um, but, you know, don't put the lion's life in danger. You know, just have respect. Keep your windows up if, if they're close. Uh, keep your windows up anyway. Um, but, you know, just again, it's all about respect. You know, if, if you don't want to become a statistic, um, you know, then don't act like an idiot, I suppose, is, is the message. Yes, correct. Uh, you, uh, what I want to say is that, especially if you're looking to do a self-drive in the park, um, lions again have become very habituated to to traffic and to vehicles. Um, and typically these animals would see a vehicle as a closed box object and they don't necessarily see you inside unless they are very close to you. So you need to stay within your vehicle. You don't want to be leaning out a window. You don't want to be hanging body parts out of a window because then you break that box object, which they see, and it makes them a lot easier to see. It's a lot easier for these animals to then focus on you as an individual in the vehicle. And that is where the danger is. Um, otherwise, these animals move around uh, very close to vehicles, right next to vehicles. Um, be sensible about what you do and you can you can have some amazing views of lines in the crew close-up views yeah brilliant okay i'm going to come back to you now and we'll finish off right hopefully you should just be seeing me and elephants now yep excellent right okay well that 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 was brilliant robert thank you it, it, it was a great insight into sort of the big five sort of where to look out for them what happens if you come across them uh, sorry for the slight interlude given the situation we're in at the moment i don't like to mess the postman about and he, he was here with 
delivering a parcel. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't want to sort of mess him about by ignoring him. So apologies for that slight interlude, but Robert filled in brilliantly for me. <laughs> so, um, right. So I think what we'll do is we'll um, leave the big five there. As we've been talking, it's been triggering in my mind all sorts of things that we need to talk about. And I know we need to talk about the the now then, let me get this right. The little five. Correct. Not the small five, which the small five, as I said, is it's listed in here. The small five leopard cub African. We're going to ignore that. We're going to go with the little five and we are going to talk about the big six birds. But I also want to do things, uh, you know, there's things like hyena and wild dog and, and hippo and, and giraffe and zebra and, and so on. They all deserve mention. So we'll leave this one. We'll do one on the other two that I've mentioned, and then we'll have a chat about how we can introduce people to these other animals. Because we mentioned hyena a lot and hyena to me are, are fantastic animals to see. So we'll talk about sort of where and when and how and wild dogs and all of that a lot in a future episode. If that's all right with you, so, I mean, I'm, I'm sort of basing this on you not going back to work tomorrow. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll keep the series going because I think there'll be a lot of interest in it. You know, if if people are going to come on safari to Kruger, you know, they, they, they want to know what else they're going to see. So we'll we'll keep it going. Yeah, great. And I'm happy to contribute uh, where possible. So uh, I look forward to future chats. Excellent. Right. Well, for now, great. Thank you very much indeed. I will speak to you in the very near future about the little five. Little five. You do know that I'm going to set all of it up as the small five, the little five, and we'll talk about them on the next episode. So for now, thanks very much, Robert. Great. Thank you. Cheers.